this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. And you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. The Chaldees. Ur of the Chaldees is known as the city of Terra and the birthplace of his son Abraham. This ancient city in lower Mesopotamia, on the banks of the Euphrates River in present-day Iraq, was first investigated by J. E. Taylor in 1854. Later explorations were made by Campbell Thompson and Dr. H. R. Hall in 1919. In 1923, systematic excavations were undertaken by a joint expedition from the British Museum and the University of Pennsylvania under the direction of Sir Leonard Woolley. The first mention of Ur of the Chaldees in the scriptures is found in Genesis chapter 11, verse 27, which reads, Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begat Lot, and Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. Then in Genesis chapter 15, verse 7, we read, And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give this land to inherit it. And again, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 7, Thou art the Lord thy God, who didst choose Abram, and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, and gavest him the name of Abraham. While we do not know if Abraham was actually born in Ur, there is little doubt that he was educated there, and none at all that he was living at Ur when he received God's command to emigrate with his father Terah into the land of Canaan to resettle at Haran. There are records that Terah had been the commander-in-chief of the Babylonian army and had led expeditions into Canaan. Thanks to various statements of dates in the Old Testament, we can arrive at a reasonably close estimate regarding the date of Abraham. It appears that he was born in 2160 B.C. and died 175 years later in 1985 B.C. Records of the heliacal risings and settings of the planet Venus have been found in Ur, no doubt for the purpose of astrology, the forerunner of astronomy, from which it has been possible to determine various dates in biblical history. Chaldean soothsayers were renowned throughout the then known world for their knowledge, with which they mixed a great deal of mysticism and superstition. A great deal of attention was paid to dreams which were given definite meanings as can be gathered from the intense anxiety of the king of Babylon to recall his dream and its interpretation from the soothsayers. Ur is also known as the site where Woolley discovered what he thought was evidence of the flood of Noah's day, a strata of water-laid clay about eight feet thick. However, when he later found contemporary settlements matching those above and below the bed of clay, Woolley realized he was dealing with a local flood which was a regular occurrence in those areas. Since the Euphrates River in antiquity flowed close by the city of Ur, such a layer of clay can fairly easily be accounted for by the changes in the course of the river or by local inundations. Mesopotamia had been formed through the ages by mud and silt washed down by the two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. This process is still continuing, and the Persian Gulf, which at the time of Abraham reached as far north as Ur, over 100 miles distant when Ur was a noted shipbuilding center, is still being filled up with alluvial mud. From the numerous inscriptions and baked clay tablets found at Ur, 
it is evident that the people were possessed of a very high degree of scientific knowledge. Tablets inscribed with rules for finding square and cube root have been found with others indicating a knowledge of astronomy that is profound. They divided the year into twelve months, some of twenty-nine days and others of thirty days, in accordance with the rotation of the moon. They made their year shorter than the true year of three hundred sixty-five and a half days, calculated from the rotation of the earth around the sun. To make up the difference, they inserted a thirteenth month of thirty days, once every six years. The Chaldeans were the ones who devised the seven-day week, in honor of the seven planets. The seventh day was a day of rest, on which no one should fight nor administer justice, nor even to take medication. They were the ones who divided the day into hours, the hour into sixty minutes, and the minute into sixty seconds. They were also responsible for the division of the circle into three hundred sixty degrees. The existence of certain values connected with the procession of the equinoxes found in their records indicated they had rules and methods of calculation, but they apparently did not know the principles that formed the basis of the calculations. This would suggest that they had inherited their astronomy from an earlier source. The Chaldean civilization with its advanced mathematics and astronomy has always baffled the archaeologists. However, this phenomenon can only be explained as the result of an influx of people from the Semitic branch of the family of Noah after the flood of Noah's area. These descendants of Noah established colonies in various parts of the earth not affected by the flood and introduced organized culture into the Tigris and Euphrates areas as well as the Nile River valleys. The writings of the historian Josephus makes reference to the Adamic origin of astronomy and mathematics. Quote, they, meaning the Sethites, also were the inventors of that peculiar sort of wisdom which concerned the heavenly bodies and their order. End quote. Ancient Persian and Arabian traditions also ascribe the invention of astronomy to Adam, Seth, and Enoch. Overshadowing the city of Ur is a great mound known as the Ziggurat, an immense square mass of brick, the outer structure some fifteen feet thick of kiln-burnt bricks, the inner structure built of bricks dried in the sun. When first seen by Taylor in 1854, the mound appeared solid. Clambering up and down and among the ledges on hands and knees in the broiling sun, Taylor made a decision that today we can only deeply regret. With no archaeological experience or training in field excavation and research, he gave orders to his workers to start at the top and pull it down. The work of destruction began at the four corners simultaneously. What had survived for centuries, that had withstood sandstorms and weather, became now the victim of tireless pickaxes. Day after day, the masses of bricks crashed down the sides to the ground. To Taylor, the shadowy past of the great mound conveyed nothing to him. He had undertaken the journey at the instigation of the British Foreign Office, which in turn was complying with a request from the British Museum that a search should be made for ancient monuments in southern Mesopotamia. Perhaps the ancient ruins found there contained old statues, ornaments, or even buried treasures that could be eventually exhibited in the museum. After a few months, the workers began to uncover little baked clay cylinders covered with cuneiform inscriptions. These were dispatched to London, but the scholars at the museum were not impressed. They had hoped that Taylor would find colossal reliefs and stone statues like those found at Nineveh and Khorsabad. Taylor continued digging for two more years before abandoning the site, unaware that he was on the top of the ziggurat of the long-sought biblical city of Ur of the Chaldees. Although now neglected by the Western world, 
the mound was by no means forgotten. No sooner had Taylor left than hordes of other visitors arrived. The broken walls of the top stages of the mound, now shattered and exposed, provided a welcome and inexhaustible supply of easily accessible building material for the local Arabs, who over the years came from far and near to depart with as many bricks as their pack animals could carry. These bricks, fashioned by men's hands thousands of years before, still bore plainly the names of Ur-Namu, the first great builder of the mound. In 1923, Leonard Woolley began carefully planned excavations of the area around the mound. His chief aim was not to start at the staged tower, but at a series of small mounds south of the ziggurat. From the moment the first spades struck the ground, an atmosphere of excitement gripped every worker. Each spadeful was like a journey into an unknown world where no one could foretell what surprises lay ahead. Suddenly, after months of digging, there emerged from the rubble solid rows of structures, row upon row of walls and facades, one after the other. As the sand was cleared away, there was revealed a checkerboard of dwellings, the ruins of which were still ten feet high in places. Between them ran little alleyways, and after several additional months of hard work and the removal of tons of sand and rubble, the diggers were faced with an unforgettable sight. There before them lay a whole city, bathed in the bright sunshine, awakened from its long sleep after many thousands of years. Ur of the Chaldees had been found. But it was a city of simple mud-brick buildings, usually one story high, with three or four rooms surrounding an open courtyard, as was found in the extolled metropolis of Nebuchadnezzar the Great of Babylon. Instead, fifteen hundred years before Babylon, the citizens of Ur were living in large two-story villas, with thirteen or fourteen rooms. The walls were built of burnt brick, the upper ones neatly whitewashed. A visitor could enter through a small entrance hall containing a water basin to wash the dust of hands and feet. He could then continue on into an inner court which was attractively paved. Round about it were grouped the reception room, the kitchen, living rooms, private rooms, and a domestic chapel. Up a stone staircase which concealed a washroom, the visitor would reach a gallery from which branched off rooms belonging to members of the family and the guest rooms. At the beginning of the second millennium B.C., Ur of the Chaldees was a prosperous, colorful, and busy capital city. We know little of the actual rites and underlying principles of the Chaldean religion, but there can be no doubt that the Chaldeans firmly believed in a future life after death. This can be seen by the great tomb of Queen Shu Ad of the early dynastic three period. Found in her tomb were the bodies of seventy court officials laid out in regular rows close to a large cauldron that appears to have been used to prepare a poison. This poison was to be administered by the court priests to them as they lay in the tomb. The reason for this wholesale slaughter was that they lived only in the king's shadow, or in this case, the queen's, and they would follow her into the next world to attend to her there, and there the queen would be responsible for their well-being. Otherwise, they would have had a miserable existence if they continued to live in Ur, for no one would have employed them. The next ruler would choose his or her own friends and followers, and would not employ those of his or her predecessor. Although many of the tombs at Ur have been plundered in antiquity and evidently by the very workers who placed the treasures in the tombs at Ur, as in Egypt, tomb robbing was a very ancient profession, and the men who followed it did not work at random, but had direct knowledge to guide them to that which was worthwhile. Hundreds of untouched private graves whose contents were valuable for scientific archaeology had no interest for the ancient seekers after treasure. Of the sixteen royal graves found in the cemetery, only two were found intact. 
In a corner of a plundered royal tomb under debris, a remarkable discovery was made. Missed by the robbers was unearthed the now famous standard of Ur. When found, it appeared to be a simple wooden panel that carried a mosaic of tiny pieces of lapis lazuli and shell. Although the wooden panel background had decayed, the mosaic fragments had sunk back into the empty space behind to keep their relative positions in the soil. So delicate was the task of removing the dirt without further disturbing the mosaic that only one square inch could be dealt with at a time. Each section was waxed as soon as cleared, but so much of the surrounding dirt mingled with the hot wax that the face of the panel soon became invisible. When the panel was finally lifted from the earth, Woolley recognized that he was faced with the problem how to restore what appeared to be this most important artifact from the past. Woolley had two choices. Take the mosaic pieces bit by bit and remake it on a new background, a task that could be done by a modern craftsman as well as was done by the old. But then the panel would have been the work of a modern craftsman. The other choice was to use a restoration procedure commonly used in similar cases. Woolley chose the latter. What was done was this, quoting from Woolley's field report. The two sides of the panel were separated, and waxed cloth was fixed to the back of the inlay, and the face of it was roughly cleaned. It was then laid face downwards on glass, and warmed until the wax was soft. It was then pressed with the fingers from behind, until, by looking underneath, one could be sure that each fragment of the inlay was in direct contact with the glass. The panel was now flat, but the pattern was much distorted, so that while some pieces overlapped, others were widely apart. The next stage was to remove the cloth from the back, leaving the mosaic virtually loose on the glass, then to pick out all the foreign matter, then by sideways pressure with the fingers, coax the pieces together. When this was done, fresh wax and cloth was applied behind and a proper backing fixed on. The results of this procedure was that Woolley restored the mosaic as the Sumerian artist had originally created it. The pieces of lapis and shell which he put together, no one else had taken apart and reset. Only when the panels were cleaned and had begun to take shape in the laboratory was their importance recognized. There were two main panels, rectangular, and measuring 22 inches long by 9 inches high, and the whole thing was fastened onto the end of a pole, and would have been carried in a procession. Digging under where the panels were found, Woolley discovered the body of a man who may have been the king's standard bearer. A pole was actually found lying against his shoulder. The mosaic was found to be composed of figures, silhouetted in shell, with details engraved which were set in a background of lapis, accentuated in red. On one side the king and the royal family are seen at a feast. They sit in chairs, their costumes consisting of old-fashioned sheepskin kilts or petticoats, the upper part of their bodies bare. Servants wait on them, and at one end of the scene a musician is playing on a small harp, while by him a woman singer with her hands to her breast sings to the accompaniment of the instrument. The figures form the top row of the design. In two lower rows, attendants are bringing in spoils, captured from the enemy, also food supplies for the banquet. One is driving a goat, another carries two fish, and another is bent under the weight of a corded bale. On the other side, in the center of the top row, stands the king, distinguished by his greater height. Behind him are three attendants, or members of his house. Next, a dwarf-like groom holds the head of two asses, which draw the monarch's empty chariot, while the driver of it walks behind, holding the reins. In front of the king, soldiers are seen bringing up prisoners, naked, and with their arms bound behind their backs, probably for the king to decide their fate. In the second row in the back comes the phalanx of the royal army, 
heavily armed infantry in close order, with copper helmets exactly like those found in the king's grave. They are holding axes in their hands, and in front of them are the lightly armed infantry wielding axes or short spears, already engaged with the enemy whose naked warriors are seen either fleeing or being struck down. In the lowest room we have the chariotry of Sumer, each drawn by two asses and carrying two men. One is the driver and the other a warrior who flings a light javelin, of which four are kept in a quiver tied to the front of the chariot. They advance over the battlefield, and by a naturalistic touch the artist makes the asses in the lead walk sedately, while those drawing the other chariots become more and more excited as they encounter the corpses strewn on the ground, while those in front have broken into a gallop which threatens the balance of the riders. The standard of Ur is a remarkable work of art, but it has a greater value as a historical document, for here we have figured the earliest detailed picture of that army which carried the civilization of the Sumerians from their earliest settlements on the fringe of the Persian Gulf to the mountains of Anatolia and as far as the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. From these pictures and actual examples from the royal graves at Ur, we know that their weapons were, both in design and manufacture, far superior to anything that their contemporaries possessed or any other nation that was to advance for two thousand years. Their chariotry was to inspire an almost superstitious terror in the Hebrews later in the time of the judges. Of all the great staged towers known as ziggurats, which characterized the cities of Sumer, that of Ur is the best preserved. The Sumerians who built it were originally hill people and worshipped their deities, among whom was the moon god Nanar. For this reason they built temples at the summit of hills. In form, the ziggurat of Ur is a stepped pyramid, having three stages. The whole hill is solid, the core being of mud bricks laid round and over the remains of the first dynasty ziggurat built by Ur-Namu. The lowest stage, which alone is well preserved, measures at ground level a little more than 200 feet in length and 150 in width, and is about 50 feet high. From this rose the upper stages, each smaller than the one below. On the topmost stage stood the little one-roomed shrine of the moon god. Three brick staircases, each of a hundred steps, led upward. One projected out at right angles from the building, two leaning against the wall of the first terrace, all converging in a great gateway between the first and second terrace. From this gate, flights of steps ran up to the second terrace as far as the door of the shrine. As Woolley's draftsmen started drawing out the plan of the ziggurat as the excavation progressed, they were puzzled to find the different measurements never seemed to agree. It was finally discovered that in the whole building there was not a single straight line. What was thought to be straight lines were in fact carefully calculated curves. The walls not only sloped inwards, but the line from top to bottom was slightly convex. The ancient architect had aimed at an optical illusion which the Greek builders of the Parthenon at Athens were to achieve many centuries afterwards, the curves being so slight as not to be apparent, yet enough to give the eye an appearance of strength where a straight line might by contrast have been plain and ugly. As designed, the slope of the walls lead the eye of the beholder upwards and inwards to the center. Then the sharper slope of the triple staircase accentuates that of the walls and fixes the attention on the shrine above, which was the religious focus of the whole structure. By the spade of the archaeologists, the ancient city of Ur emerges from the shadowy past as the capital of the Sumerians, one of the oldest civilizations in Mesopotamia, now Iran and Iraq. As we know, the Sumerians were not Semites like the Hebrews, but when the great invasion of Semite nomads streamed out from the Arabian desert a little before 2100 B.C., 
the Hebrews' first encounter with the Sumerians was the extensive holdings of the people of Ur, their houses, farms, canals, and most importantly, their wealth from trade. Although it appears that Terah was a citizen of Ur, the Bible indicates that his son Abram was a tent dweller, living the life of a typical nomad, moving with flocks from pasture to pasture and from well to well. It also appears that Terah was associated with idolatry and served other gods as we read in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 2. However, when Abram left his country taking his wife Sarai and his fatherless nephew Lot, his father Terah also accompanied him, as is recorded in Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. This would suggest that Abram, who was of the household of Shem, and who had been brought up in the fear of the Lord under the influence of his mother, had converted his father Terah to the worship of the one true God. Over 4,000 years ago, Terah, Lot, and Abraham called Ur their home. It was at Ur that Sarah became the wife of Abraham. No doubt he and Sarah walked the streets of Ur and gazed up to the great temple to the moon god on the topmost platform of the ziggurat. We are not told in the scriptures the reason Abraham had to leave his native land, but we are given full information as to God's plan concerning him and his descendants who were to be God's servants formed to establish his kingdom on earth. In Genesis we read, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed.